Hello, my name is Robert Gregory, and I'm an alcoholic. You should say, Hello, Robert. I took my time in Alcoholics Anonymous very seriously. I'm still Bob's friend, sober and abstinent for over ten years. It took a disaster in my life for me to realize how seriously my inability to give up the bottle was affecting those around me. I lost my wife first. I thought it was her problem, but she knew it was mine. My children stayed with me for a while, but when their mother decided it was time to leave, I tried to convince them that I would become a better person. You probably know I couldn't, and they left to live with mom. I don't receive any birthdays or Father's Day cards from them. I think this message to me is that, as a father, I was a failure. I started drinking heavily when I was 36, and the company I started was making very big profits. But this drinking does not compare to when I found out about my wife's infidelity. My leadership team would join me almost every Friday afternoon at the country club to relax and blow off steam after a busy work week. We were a hybrid company, both developing software and reselling software to smaller companies that were compatible with our platform. We were typically faster than the competition, offered a quality product at a fair price, and offered the best maintenance and upgrade program in our category. Once we had all dealt with the Y2K problem, we focused on system security and integrity, as well as system redundancy, to ensure it worked day after day, minute after minute, nanosecond after nanosecond. A couple of us were nerds in school, but by the late 30s, we had certainly blossomed into loud, assertive leaders. We worked hard, partied a little, and some of us drank a lot. I, I was off the scale. I was born in northern Michigan, in the Upper Peninsula in Marquette in 1965. There's not much to say about the Upper Peninsula other than it's cold six months of the year and probably shouldn't be considered part of Michigan since it's not adjacent to it. Drive north from Wisconsin and you'll enter the Upper Peninsula. I was the only child of my parents, Wanda and Simon Gregory. Wanda was the principal of Marquette High School and Simon was our town's real estate attorney in a town where real estate rarely changed hands. Somehow, Dad found a way to keep our income stable. And after high school, I went to the University of Michigan in 1983 in Ann Arbor. I couldn't use the capital THE because people in Ohio go crazy and claim copyrights for the use of the capital THE. Well, when your mascot is a nut, that's understandable. I was an electrical engineering student, although I was leaning towards a career in computer science. A good electrical engineering student was guaranteed a good future in computer science, so I was protected. Companies were still heavily dependent on old-fashioned mainframe computers and had a hard time managing complex coding that took years to develop, was expensive to maintain, and became completely obsolete after two to five years. Universities actively followed these changes, as many of them were tested or perfected in their laboratories. We knew it was going to be huge, so after finishing my bachelor's degree and completing some technical requirements, I started focusing on software, programming, and things like system security. You can really show your age when you mention the early days of the World Wide Web and accessing sites, where you only saw lines of code or accessing some files that looked the same as the file save on your computer today. If you really want to confuse young people, tell them about modem, access. At the university, I was a member of the engineering fraternity. It wasn't one of the strongest. And we didn't throw huge parties and had sex every weekend. At various times in my student life, I dated a girl I really liked. I've had steady girlfriends a couple of times, but nothing that led to engagement. With the help of a loan from my father, I started a small company in the Chicago suburbs to provide software and services to companies that were just starting to implement PCs for their staff and learning to deal with things like email, electronic calendars, and this strange innovation called Worldwide Cobwebs. The president of a small manufacturing company came to me and asked, I was told that there is obscene content on these computers. I assured him that if it was on the computers, it was in someone else's office. He looked at me and said, Oh, I see. I realized that he wasn't worried. He was just hoping. Yes, we all do it. Even wives. Although they won't admit it. My business brought in good money, but took up almost all of my time. I was still single and I liked the idea of having someone to share my life with. 
Loneliness was not my goal. I started dating this woman named Joan, and I really liked her. I received an offer to buy my business and accepted it in order to pay off my debt to my father and have some extra funds to buy a house in the future. I was hired by a startup company as the head of engineering. For what they were doing at the time, I was retrained. But for what we did three years later, I had to push myself. Fortunately, during this period, I asked Joan to be my wife. We got married and had our first child, just as I was brought into the executive directorate as vice president of engineering. Good salary, stock options. We weren't a public company yet, but I was told it was a path worth taking. As our products and services matured, a second child was born, this time a daughter and my wife stopped working to raise our two children. As we finished preparing for Y2K, our third child was born, and life couldn't have been better. Barron's had an article about young private companies, and ours was highlighted as one of them. While it didn't initially help us sell millions of dollars worth of product, it did make some things better. Young graduates wanted to work with us. We were inundated with applications, and although we already had some stars working for us, Suddenly, we became the place for the best and the brightest. When our last child was born, I became the new senior vice president of products and services, including hardware, software, and services. Our sales were on track to reach $1 billion this year. My salary was over $1 million, and I converted my bonus into stock options. We actively talked about going public. But then two things happened. First of all, I became an asshole. No, not only was I an asshole sometimes, but from my morning alarm to my nightly sleep pill to knock me out, I was rude, demanding, and insensitive. It didn't come slowly. I was once a normal guy. Getting rich, yes, but not a complete jerk. Maybe it happened over the weekend, normal in the office on a Friday afternoon and a violent tyrant from the first Monday morning. But I said two things, didn't I? Well, I forgot to mention that I fell in love again, no, I was not a cheater. No, not in the sense of a cheater, but I cheated. I loved alcohol more than I loved my wife and family. It didn't matter. A great scotch, a delicious Merlot, a 70-year-old cognac, or a bad beer that had been warmed by the sun. If it had an alcohol percentage, I was in business. I knew when this new love began. It was two weeks after my wife returned to work. Okay, I'll take a step back from what I said. Yes, I gradually became an asshole for most people. Today, thinking back on this as part of my 12 steps, I became this asshole primarily to my wife. This was likely the catalyst for her returning to work. She needed real adults around her, not this immature jerk she married. As a result, I pushed her into the arms of the first gigolo she met at work, with predictable results. She liked him a lot more than I did, and it started in 2008 and ended in 2009 when I threatened to ruin her and she backed off until she found someone else. But before that, our company was sold. I had one million options priced at $1.50 per share. The purchasing company was publicly traded and would convert my one million shares into 600,000 shares of their company at $7 per share. The economy hit their shares hard, and they fell 79% from their previous high of $80 per share. Technically, I had 600,000 shares worth $16.80 minus the $7 strike price. Not a killer, but still convertible, but with no real pre-trade value. This was the $5 million nest egg I was hoping for in the future. Well, Joan hid her second affair better than her first, and it was a full-blown real romance. At least that's what she said when she confronted me. I love him not you. I remember this even though I was deep into 0.75 liters of Johnny Walker Black at the time. To shorten the story, her affair could not be stopped. I was drinking to excess almost every day at this point, but was still very capable of doing my job. My wife filed for divorce in 2011, accusing me of cruelty and abuse. I filed a counterclaim on the basis of multiple infidelities, and the lawyers began to act. At this point, I had already paid over $400,000 in legal bills. The company I worked for was purchased again by another, and the new company decided that I was probably surplus to requirements in their organization. They agreed to buy my options, pay out my golden parachute, and a severance package. 
The compensation party at that time was over $20 million, and the stock options were slightly better at $40 million. There will be a tax bite, but about $25 million went into the bank account. Did you say I was still drinking? No, only now it wasn't drinking. It was binge drinking. I was still living in Chicago when another small startup company in Cincinnati offered me an interview for a CEO position. I really didn't want this job. It would interfere with my first love, drinking. But they hired me at $4 million a year with stock options. It was an internet company, and when I finally understood why they hired me, I was ecstatic. I was their face, a person with a reputation in the industry, which might make it easier for them to go public. The dot-dot-com companies caused the market crash after Y2K and again after 9-11. But that was in the past. A new parade of these companies had begun, and this was one of them. I tried to do the best job I could, but investors didn't want good work. They wanted a silent CEO. This was combined with my drinking. Now it was 2013. You would have thought I was crazy, but I still hadn't checked with my lawyer about my divorce. I put what I calculated as chilled support and chilled support until they turned 18 into an escrow account with a lawyer. Little did I know, my day of reckoning was near. First, an internet company. On my desk was a check for five million and papers to sign. I quickly signed. I was tired of pretending. Three months later, I was interviewed on CNBC about an alleged accounting fraud, and I pointed directly at the accounting firm and told the world that it was their fault. I just lost my future role as CEO, but damn if you can't take the joke. I took my cash reserve and started day trading. You can rack up a huge tax debt doing this, but that means you made a lot of money, and I made a lot of money. Why was I still living in Cincinnati? I liked it here. I lived in an apartment by the river. I liked the Cincinnati Bengals, such lovable losers, and the Reds. I was a Tigers fan, grew up hating the White Sox, so I couldn't root for them when I lived in Chi-Town. The Reds could have been an all-American team if they had tried a little harder. It was late 2017, and I had been away from my family for over five years. After the Bengals game, I decided to go to a friendly bar. He wasn't very friendly today. Some Vikings fans showed up after they trashed us on the field and decided to do the same to the fans. Fortified with enough alcohol to sterilize the COVID ward, I helped fight the crowd. I woke up in the emergency room at Cincinnati General, only to pass out again to find myself in a room with two residents. Good evening, Mr. Gregory. Do you know what day it is today? Of course, it's Monday, the day after the Bengals once again embarrassed themselves on the football field. I fought the Vikings fans harder than the Bengals did on the field. Very funny, Mr. Gregory. But you are not a comedian, and today is not Monday. Today is Friday, and you have spent the better part of four days in an alcoholic stupor. While you were oscillating between inarticulateness and coma, we were able to diagnose some of the problems you now have in life. Your blood pressure is through the roof. It's the highest I've seen in a living person during my time as a resident. Your brain scan proves that you still have a brain, but that's it. You realize that you've had at least, at least one minor stroke in your life, maybe two, but we kept you here so we can operate on one of the blood vessels in your brain that's, uh, bleeding? It's scheduled for tomorrow with your permission. Your next drink may be your last in your life. Your heart and liver are bigger and will not stand up to such treatment, so the decision is yours. I found you on the internet. You have impressive business credentials. Where the hell have you been doing your brain work? Was it at that company that the SEC is investigating? One more insult, and I'd throw these guys out if I could only remember where I put my hands. I came out of surgery and could not be discharged as planned. Another bleeder has appeared and I'm coming back tomorrow. I'm glad I negotiated health insurance as part of my exit package. As I was being prepared to be discharged back to my apartment, the senior resident who had joined in the exchange of insults approached me to talk. He was 35, a bit old for a resident. Mr. Gregory, may I speak to you? I stopped and turned to him. Mr. Gregory, I was you, ten years ago, very confident, one of the smartest students at Boston University School of Medicine. I had a wonderful residency ahead of me and was celebrating wildly as my start date approached. I was going crazy with alcohol and he was crazy about me. 
I didn't complete my requirements at Boston University and lost my prestigious residency. Instead, my parents made me join AA. You know, they used to be called Alcoholics Anonymous. But now they use AA because it helps with any addictions. They changed my life. No, change that. They saved my life because I was on the road to self-destruction. Here's their brochure. They meet every Tuesday night at the Olive Street Presbyterian Church. They will save you from yourself. Save yourself, Mr. Gregory. You may not think it right now, but you are worth saving. With these words, I was sent home. I was within walking distance of my apartment and decided to walk. But I walked for three hours, talking to myself the whole time. I had harsh words for myself. You see, the person I hated most in this world was me. This was truly my first step on a thousand-mile journey. It was Friday. On Tuesday, I met a former alcoholic named Ralph. He became my sponsor and friend for life. Only I didn't know that his life would be short. This happens if you have ever abused alcohol. It was 2017, and I finally felt sober in 2020. I realized that I hadn't touched a drop of alcohol since that date in 2017, but I was only now feeling in control of my urge to drink. There were thousands of moments of temptation, then hundreds, then fifty, thirty, ten, one. But it was always there. I knew I was sober when I realized what a bad person I was, and realized that as part of the Twelve Steps, I needed to atone for my wrongdoings. I tried to apologize to everyone I had wronged, but I found the list was too long and I couldn't find most of them. I know this is a workaround, but I have decided to be generous with my wealth. I still went to AA, but also traded the stock market, and from 2019 to early 2021, it was almost impossible to go wrong. The ups and downs drove you crazy, but the trend continued to rise upward. Naomi was after taxes, almost 70 million in stocks and securities. If the market had tanked like it did in 2003 or 2009, I would have been left with about 15 million, something I could live on. I gave Ralph a check for $500,000 for his church. This was a church in a poor community that had many spiritual and material needs, but no wealthy benefactor. I decided that I would be that person. When Ralph became seriously ill, I arranged for him to receive 24-hour care. When he died and no relatives could be found, I paid for his funeral and gave $1 million to his church to build a new building in memory of Ralph Sessions, one of God's wonders. I was very lonely during Ralph's illness until his death. We've talked to each other at least twice a week since I graduated from AA. Now, I wasn't just lonely. I was thirsty for a drink. You feel sick when you need to drink. The only way to feel worse is if you successfully resist. The desire becomes stronger and stronger, and if you conquer it, you can live another day. I wanted this next day and week and month and year. I had sins that needed to be corrected. December is a terrible time for loneliness and absolute loneliness. I tried not to wallow in my misery, but I allowed it at this time of year. It was three weeks before Christmas, and I was remembering the happy days when we were still a family. Three kids and a Christmas tree, gifts from Santa, family dinners, and the special gift I gave Joan every year. In good years, on Christmas morning, gift in hand, I would kneel next to Joan and repeat my wedding vows to her. I did it slowly, thinking deeply about every word I said. How could I let my love for her fade away? I loved her so much and I threw her away for a bottle of scotch. I sat there full of tears and I needed to get out of the apartment. I had to head out into the night, walking in the cold air despite the ongoing COVID-19 lockdown. I went out more and more due to my depression, using the hours after 10 p.m. to avoid contact with real people. That night, at the parking meter, I saw a woman, maybe a little younger than me, clearly in trouble. I knew the feeling, but she didn't look like an alcoholic. She looked like a mother who had lost her children somewhere. I stopped to talk to her. Excuse me, are you okay? She looked up at me. She was scared, very scared. I'm not going to hurt you. Is there anything I can do to help? She was shaking visibly but could not answer. Here, let me help you up. But as I approached her, she fell to the ground. She was clearly going through some kind of medical episode. She mentioned her young children again and again. 
I thought she was several years younger than me, but she was talking about little children. I looked at her again and realized that this was not normal, perhaps a stroke. So I called an ambulance. While waiting, I heard her say, Peter, I'm sorry, Peter, I'm sorry. And then she lost consciousness. I heard an ambulance in the distance, and a policeman approached, concerned that I was standing over a woman who had lost consciousness. What did I do? I explained to him how I came across this woman who was clearly in medical trouble and told him that I called an ambulance, hoping that the siren in the distance was for this woman. The policeman believed me, but waited until the ambulance arrived. I heard a radio call from the ambulance. The patient was not responding. Her blood pressure was at emergency level. Suspect stroke based on lack of response. I asked where they were taking her and they said Good Samaritan Hospital. I asked the officer where it was and he asked if I was going there and I said yes. Get in my police car, I'll take you. His police car arrived at the hospital before the ambulance and I went in with him. He pointed to a chair nearby and said, sit. He seemed to know the medical personnel waiting at the entrance and pointed at me, saying, this guy found her lying in the street. He's worried, but he's not related. Let him stay here. I saw him cry for almost 10 minutes. He needs it, okay? The ambulance unloaded outside and was quickly dragged into the treatment area on a stretcher. The proximity of Christmas surprisingly hasn't made the ER busier. She had a full team taking care of her needs. The head nurse came up to me and asked, What's your name? Robert, will she be okay? I said. Robert, I cannot give you any information about her since, as far as I understand, you are not related. Do you know who she is or where she lives? No, I just saw her in trouble at 10th and Olive and went over to help. She spoke a little, but mostly indistinctly. I called an ambulance when I thought it might be a stroke. I heard the doctors come out and talk to the nurse. She's homeless, isn't she? No insurance, no known relatives. We do not typically accept these types of cases, so please prepare to transfer her to Cincinnati General. They'll take care of her, but they just brought in accident victims in five cars on I-75, and they'll be busy for a few hours. I went to the doctors and begged them, if you transfer her, she will die. My mother suffered such a stroke and survived. They said that every minute counts and they managed to do everything necessary. I guarantee to pay her bills. I'll even write you a check right now. Just take care of her, please. It doesn't seem right to me that her last moments on this earth should be the words of anguish that I heard. Please show mercy. The doctor called the administrator on duty. He said it was very unusual. He had never heard of a stranger agreeing to pay the medical expenses of someone who had no means of support. He asked, how much is he willing to pay up front? I told him, $50,000 tonight. You can contact me in the morning and I will bring more if needed. Please, this woman's life is worth saving. The administrator answered me, sir, all lives are worth saving. Asshole Robert came back for a second and said, then save her now. What are you waiting for? The doctor got the go-ahead and said that after the MRI, she would be sent for surgery. I said I'd be sitting here when the surgery was over and he could tell me how much his bill was. I sat there all night and into the early hours of the next morning, getting up only to use the toilet or grab a cup of coffee generously provided by the nurses. I was almost asleep when the ER doctor came out and said, I know you, don't I? I looked at it and almost said no, but then I took a closer look. Yes, but I never knew your name. You saved my life by recommending AA to me several years ago. I thought you were crazy, but you were right. My drinking caused me to lose my family and my job, and now I'm trying to correct my mistakes because I can't find my wife and kids to apologize to them. But I can sincerely say that you saved the life of one patient who still thanks you every day. The ER nurse came over to talk to the doctor. It turned out that they were married. He was the doctor who saw our mystery woman in the treatment ward and recognized her symptoms. He had already ordered an MRI before I got involved with the receptionist. His wife told him about my day and my contribution to this woman's care. Dr. Murphy was his name, and he turned to me and said, I go back there at least once a month. Do you still go to those meetings at First Presbyterian? 
I sadly replied, no, my sponsor and best friend died 18 months ago. I have had many sad moments in my life, most of them self-inflicted, but his death hit me hard. But it also strengthened my commitment to sobriety because I made that promise to Ralph. At the request of the hospital, the police officer was asked to remove me from the emergency room. When he arrived, I saw that it was the same policeman who gave me a ride. He saw a member of the hospital security waiting next to me, expecting him to escort me outside. He approached the security guy and said something to him. He then came and sat next to me and smiled. I told the security guy to bring us coffee. I'll wait here with you until the hospital administrator arrives. I'll be here to support you. You're a good person, Robert. The world needs more like you. I know there were about 100 HIPAA rules violated during my two-day stay, and my body odor may have rivaled that of hundreds of homeless people in the city. The surprising result was that, with the help of a couple of lawyers, the court allowed patient A to be discharged into my care. One small step for humanity, one giant leap forward for a broken man. The problem with patient A was that she was clearly not homeless. Her clothes did not resemble those of a person living on the streets. She was in good health, except for a stroke and memory loss. When she was discharged, I sat with her in the hospital room, telling her that I had agreed to give her shelter while she tried to regain her memory. I told her where I lived and that I no longer worked a real job but made money trading stocks. She will have her own bedroom and bathroom in my three-room apartment, which can be locked from the inside. I even got my new friend, Officer Kelly, to agree to check in every day to make sure she was okay. She realized that she had no other choice and agreed to accept my help. I was warned by the doctors that her memory would be a little worse for a few days after the surgery, but that most of the lost memory would return. What was lost due to the original event is another matter. She would feel bad if it weren't for the fact that we are now five days before Christmas and it is snowing. She asked me if I had Christmas music. I said no, but then I remembered that my cable TV had music channels and we listened for a while. Then she started singing and I joined her. We played through about 20 popular Christmas songs, and I realized she had a lot of memories in her brain. She will get better. I gave Miss A, as I began to call her, several gifts for Christmas. Since we didn't know where she lived, she only had the clothes she was wearing, so we went to the mall and bought her some new things that first day. We discussed going to church on Christmas, but she was afraid she would stand out. Like the Grinch, my heart grew that day, and I yearned for connections with people. Not at work, I no longer had a job. The church could be such a place, but not this Christmas. Missa was still too vulnerable mentally, but I bought her a very beautiful dress, and it was just right. She noticed something by the fireplace. I never thought I'd see the day when I'd have a Bible in my home, but all those days at church made me decide I needed one. Miss A took it and began to read Bible verses. Another victory followed another huge one. I remember teaching the Bible to children in church. My children were in my class. As I turned my head towards her to find out more, she couldn't remember what she had just said. It was frustrating for her, but rewarding for me. I knew she could handle it, just like Ralph told me on my worst day of trying to stay sober. I hadn't heard anything from the hospital about additional bills, so two days before New Year's, I called their collections department. I explained who I was and explained how I paid part of the bill when it was accepted. The head of the collections department called and said that I was entitled to a refund. I asked why, and he said, Have you ever heard of the GoFundMe page on Facebook? I replied, What is Facebook? Oh, Mr. Gregory, you lived in privacy. Facebook is a social networking site. Children have been using it for years to keep track of their friends. The nurses caring for the patient told other nurses about your gesture and willingness to welcome this woman into their home. They, we launched a page for her. This nurse is married to one of the doctors who treated her. I heard this, and it brought joy to my broken heart. The doctor who pulled me out of the hole continued to do good. His wife was his catalyst, and people all over the world made the right choices. Not only did the GoFundMe page pay off the remaining balance of the debt, but it also covered your down payment. Don't worry, with the publicity now spreading, 
The hospital will be donating a lot of that money towards future care for those in need. The good deeds continue, I guess. I wondered if it was the story or people's desire to do good deeds during the holidays. That wasn't all she did. After our celebration New Year's celebrations in my apartment and games in the New Year's Bowl, I discovered that she was rooting for the University of Oregon. Where did this come from? Oh, and I got a call from the local ABC affiliate. They wanted to interview us. I said no, but Miss A disagreed and said yes. Maybe someone could tell me who I am. She was right. We decided to give Ms. A time to recover and scheduled an interview towards the end of January. It was the 29th when the interview was conducted as the reporter arrived. I didn't want to be the center of attention. I just wanted to do the right thing. I could be no more than a voice in the background while the reporter asked Ms. A questions. Other than her name and location, Miss A did great. Watching her charm the reporter and show such calmness while answering questions, I realized how easily I could fall in love with this woman. Day after day I was by her side, and our friendship grew into affection, and our affection turned into a kind of love, a love that I had not felt in over twelve years. Warm, tender kisses have become a part of our daily life. They were short kisses, but I felt the intensity of each of them. Often we slept together simply enjoying the warmth of another person. I knew that I often woke up excited in the morning, but I never let Miss A see the result of our hug. It was early March, and Miss A was recovering more and more memories from her past, and I felt like we were on the cusp of finding out her name and where she lived when I got a call from the local ABC station. We were unaware that the network had distributed the interview for use by any national affiliate. They said a private detective agency in the Dallas area wanted to talk to Ms. A. They had a client who thought Miss A might be his 51-year-old wife. She was originally from Oregon, but moved to the Midwest with him around 1999. They divorced in 2010, and she received custody of the children, but turned to alcohol due to the pressures of work and caring for the home. Her husband regained custody in early 2012, and by 2015, she had disappeared completely and everyone had lost track of her. Their divorce, like mine, was provoked by infidelity. They gave me a phone number to call. It was a very interesting conversation. They said a Dallas client hired them to find his ex-wife, believing she might still be in the Cincinnati area. Their detectives found an old phone number and left messages on the answering machine, but never received a response. Then a few days ago, one of their agents saw a positive story on the morning news about a woman in Cincinnati who had lost most of her memory, and a good Samaritan gave her shelter and helped her regain her memory. We thought it must be her. That's when they called the TV station. The TV station called me, and I made the call. It's time for me to have a conversation with my best friend, Miss A. Only now she has a name, and it's beautiful. Rita Collins. I will have this conversation with her in the morning, but first I called the psychologist we were working with to determine my role and how to proceed with Ms. A. He was helpful. No mass invasion of family or friends, just her husband or maybe baby for a visit, but not both at the same time. He advised me to accept that we had a connection with her and she would not easily give up this connection. Her future is in my hands. Oh God, this is too much pressure. Oh God, I need a drink. But I resisted and won this confrontation. The morning started with our usual cup of coffee. It ended with a raver of tears, but I'm pretty sure that 90% of them were tears of happiness. I decided to be bold and straightforward. I told Miss A that I had potentially wonderful news. I asked her if it was possible that her name was Rita, and she immediately became worried. The psychologist said she may become anxious if something feels right and frightens her. He was absolutely right. Then I mentioned the call last night and how someone had seen the interview in another city and thought she might be the ex-wife of the man who was looking for her. He said her children were desperate to find her. I asked if she thought she could have children and she quickly nodded her head. I then asked if the name Peter meant anything to her. She nodded again, but this time she said, I think he's my husband, and burst into tears. Her tears flowed for over 15 minutes and I was afraid she would become dehydrated but we found her personality and the people in her life really missed her and wanted to see her. I wish I could be this happy in my own life. 
Finally, I told her that Peter wanted to talk to her about returning to his family in Texas. I tried to look away. I was in so much pain and it was only getting worse, but I couldn't show it. I think Rita expected me to say, no, that she should stay with me, but that was the wrong answer. Her look at me was pleading, and yet I knew I couldn't. Finally, I said, Rita, the agency will set up a call with Peter. After your conversation, he can come to visit, and we will move on, okay? And again, she nodded. I called the agency to schedule a call for tomorrow. We decided that Peter would come to Cincinnati alone in five days. Peter was expected to arrive mid-afternoon on Thursday and return home on Sunday, barring any obstacles. As the days approached, perhaps it was the shock of discovery, but Rita remembered where she lived and worked. I was shocked that with all the publicity surrounding her memory loss, her place of work didn't put two and two together regarding her absence after three years of perfect attendance. How could they not have guessed that it could have been her in the newspapers and on television? Losing that job was a blessing if they thought so little of the employee. We went to her apartment and talked to the landlord. He was very understanding and reasonable. There was a new lock on the door, but he was happy to take it off and told me, now that I know she was that woman in history, tell her she doesn't have to worry about rent arrears. I told him that we would remove all of her things within two days and he could rent out the apartment sooner rather than later. Rita was so happy to be reunited with her clothes. It was worn out, but what was important was that it was her stuff. It was Wednesday afternoon, and Peter was due to arrive tomorrow. I saw Rita going through her things and saw a photo of Peter. He was very handsome. Then I saw pictures of her children and how adorable they were. We started talking, and I told her my story about Joan and how we fell in love, how I fell in love with work and then with alcohol, and how it ruined our relationship. I did not accuse Joan of infidelity to Rita during this time of our communication. That night, knowing that tomorrow the world would change, we were as close as lovers. But I could not cross this border. Rita stroked my face, thanking me for my kindness. We also talked about memories of our spouses. She remembered the good times. I wanted to remember them, but that night there were only bad moments in my head. The night had already been long, and Rita leaned over to wish me good night. We've done this almost every night for the last four months, but tonight it was different. It scared me. I couldn't remember the kiss being so tender, and I started crying and having trouble breathing. I told Rita that she meant more to me than anyone in my past, but I knew that it was like a mother caring for a child, and not like the love of a husband and wife. She turned to me and said, you protected and supported me during a dark time in my life. Today is the happiest day of my life. Despite the birth of my children, I am as happy as I was on my wedding day in 1993. June 17, 1993, 28 years ago. I was still crying and wondering what I had just heard. You said your wedding day was June 17, 1993? Yes. Even after my divorce, I celebrated June 17th as a holy day in the Christian faith. We vowed to love each other to death. I know I failed, but I will give my organs another chance. Rita, your wedding date was the date of my wedding. I think it's more than a coincidence that our paths crossed. Between karma and destiny, we will always have our connection. Peter arrived a little late. It was almost 3 p.m. when he arrived and knocked on the door. I let Rita respond, and any questions I had were resolved by their reaction. They wouldn't need me today. I introduced myself to Peter, asked if they needed anything, and then said, I see you know each other. Here is my mobile phone number. Call me if you want me to bring you some takeout. For a moment, I wondered if it was a mistake. They had been separated for years. Could I trust him? Was he good enough for my dear Rita? I needed to stop thinking like that. I got back to my apartment around 10.30 p.m. I recognized the smell and it was wonderful. It was the smell of a beautiful reconciliation and I was so happy for Rita. Her stroke was caused in part by agony over the loss of her family. Within half a day, Peter and Rita revowed their love, which somehow went off the rails. I will be alone again, but at least for a while it will be happy loneliness.
When it was time for Peter to leave on Sunday, they announced their intentions. Robert, Peter asked me to come home with him. In that short time, he reminded me that he still loved me and I still loved him. We are going to move me back to the Dallas area so I can rejoin my family. I'm very afraid, but it wouldn't be possible if you haven't been with me these months. Peter will be back next week, and we will load my things into the rental truck and head out. I want to spend the last days with you before he returns. I want to say goodbye until he comes back. He said I was more than he could ever repay. I thought about that comment. Was he inviting me to have sex with his wife? Or he assumed that we had already been doing this for months. I doubled down on my decision. She is a wonderful woman, but nothing should stand in the way of their reconciliation. Peter's return was too fast, but I knew that within minutes I would lose the second woman I truly loved. But the truck was loaded and ready to leave. Peter hugged me and said, Thank you for saving us. I already lost her, but I would be destroyed if she died. Rita hugged me long and tightly. I didn't think this little woman could have such power. She said something about a message on the phone and handed me a piece of paper. I quickly looked at it and didn't understand what it meant. I put it in my wallet for later. I helped her into the cab of the rental truck, blew her a kiss, and they headed toward Dallas, Texas. Ten minutes later, my cell phone rang. It was a new number. It was Rita. She called me to say, I know we will see each other again. I wish you all the best and the love of your family once again in your life. The truck was long gone, and as I walked back to my apartment, I whispered, I can only wish. Ralph, can you perform another miracle? I don't think so. Since it was spring, I heard thunder. Of course, I saw lightning too. Is that you, Ralph? I laughed, and another flash immediately followed. Dallas, Texas, June 25th. 2021. Rita was still beaming after being reunited with her family. She had been home, yes, her actual home, for about ten weeks. Peter smiled again. Her children told her that seeing him smile in all the years of her absence was rare. Yes, her infidelity had hit him hard, and the girls still harbored some resentment toward her. But seeing their father's smile, they knew that forgiveness had begun. Today is a special day. After they worked through the issues of their reunion, Peter decided to throw a party for the neighbors. Rita had the opportunity to meet neighbors with whom Pete and the children had been friends for 12 years. Of course, not all of them lived here for so long. The limited turnover of homes in this desirable area meant that new people were easy to recognize. As the families started arriving, Rita was overwhelmed trying to remember the names. Most came as families, but one family, a woman with three grown children, all college age or older, came inside and was greeted warmly by Peter. Peter explained to me that she told him that she was a widow who had lost her husband ten years ago. She was sad to talk about him. He was an alcoholic. Pete, I want to get to know her better. She has sad eyes. I know that look. It's been mine for the last ten years. Maybe I can pay Robert's kindness forward. With Pete's full agreement, Rita began to become friends with Joan. Joan's youngest son was 11 years old when he lost his father. His name was Greg. Now, 21, he's in his senior year at Texas A&M. The second boy, Peter, is 23, graduated from Texas Tech with an engineering degree, and recently got a job with an oil exploration company. Her daughter, Sarah, was an accountant and was married with a 12-month-old girl and a husband named Roger. Rita learned a lot about Joan's past during their almost daily conversations. By mid-August, they had become such close friends that all barriers were removed, and both began to tell the truth about their past. Rita explained how it was her infidelity that destroyed her bond with her kind and loving husband, and ultimately, the loss of her children. Joan could see the pain in her heart when she decided to be brutally honest about what she had done to her family. Joan, I wondered what I would say to Rita. It seems like our Livies had some similarities. We both did stupid things during our marriages that cost us dearly. Rita's situation was different. Her infidelity cost her her marriage, access to her children, and a lifestyle that nearly cost her her life. How do I tell someone who has paid a heavy price that I have walked away free from sin? 
Could I tell Rita that I had an alcoholic husband who was verbally abusive and I was afraid for my children? Of course, this is what I first told everyone after my family fell apart. I had to admit that after moving to this new area, I simply told everyone that I was a widow, and even my children went along with it. But the other day, Rita and I started telling more truths. I decided to tell Rita the absolute truth. I had a good husband. He loved me very much and also loved the children. He started his own business, but eventually, he then sold it to a large company, receiving shares in return. His salary was excellent, so we didn't lack anything. I was 39 years old and I was stupid. I had an affair at work for almost a year. I didn't get caught, so when the opportunity came to start another one, I did it. I thought I'd never get caught until I did. Not once, but twice. My husband forgave me the first time, and I told him that I ended my relationship with that guy. I noticed that my husband began to drink a lot and spent many nights unconscious. I thought there was no need for me to end my relationship with the second guy because he wasn't himself some nights. Then he found us in our house, in our bed, and flew into a rage. Rita suggested I take a break and offered me some wine. Rita didn't touch him. She knew that her past alcoholism could always do a lot of damage. I took a sip and continued my story. When I saw my husband the next day, he had been on a 20-hour bender. I'm not sure he heard what I said clearly, but I think he understood. I screamed that he was a drunk, a bad father, and a terrible lover. He could stay, but I'll still enjoy my lover a couple of times a week. You'll be a cuckold for the rest of your life. I did it to the man I loved. Rita realized that I had pushed my husband out the door and would probably never see him again. Joan, are you really a widow? or just divorced. Rita, I'm not even divorced. After that event, my lover Ed started complaining that the sex wasn't as good as it used to be and asked what my problem was. When I started thinking about it, I was good. No, not a good one. A great lover when she wanted to humiliate her husband. How did I become so angry? I had another affair that year. It did not bring me any satisfaction. For the last ten years I have lived in chastity, without desire for sex. After finishing my story, I sat there and cried, as I should have for the last twelve years. Rita promised to tell me her story tomorrow. Mine took all evening. I'm not proud of myself, but she hugged me and told me to stop hating myself. If your husband is still out there somewhere, he's probably already forgiven you. Rita I've been trying to reach Joan for several days. Her son said she took a couple of days off from work because she wasn't feeling well. I knew why. Joan tore the tightly bandaged bandage off her body after ten years, and it was very painful. Now, in the light of day, in the fresh air, with a little tender love and care, I hoped that I could help her regain her happiness. My Robert did this for me. He was wounded, almost mortally, but nevertheless he climbed out of the ditch, the one he created for himself, and threw himself back almost every day. But over time, he recovered himself and even admitted that he became a much better person by helping me. I never received the final amount from the hospital, but I know that at one point the cost of my treatment exceeded a hundred thousand dollars. It was the generosity of the people that allowed him to get his money back, but he immediately gave it back to them for future care of patients in need. I finally got through to Joan, and she said she was feeling a little better and invited my husband and I to dinner on Saturday. I said I would be glad and we could continue our conversation if she was still willing to listen to my story. Joan said, Would your husband feel uncomfortable hearing about your past and even the time with your friend? Where were you then? I replied, in Cincinnati, and Joan said she thought her ex-husband might have lived there for a while after their divorce. I laughed and said that Cincinnati was the most boring city you will ever find. Wonderful, boring people. Most of them will do anything for you. Oh, and Joan, my time with my friend was very special, but we were never intimate. I felt the urge, but he was so focused on me regaining memories of my past and identity that we kissed like brother and sister, but never the way I did with my husband before I lost my way. When Peter came to his apartment that day to reconnect with me, my friend did everything right. 
By nightfall, Peter and I made love like newlyweds. It was the most exciting day of my life. After dinner, my husband went to babysit Joan's youngest son. He was in his senior year at Texas A&M, and football season had already begun in Texas, and here we even treat high school football as a must-see event. Joan and I were sitting in her dining room just chatting after the dishes had been put away. Joan, we seem to have had almost parallel lives. It was so strange to discover that we were almost the same age and had similar experiences as children and probably became stupid at about the same time. My marriage to Peter was wonderful, and we were happy. We had two kids, both girls, and you have two boys and a girl. I was never a big party girl in college, but I worked in an office where the women created their own sisterhood and found ways to have a little fun. I had to know this because in my first year of work, two of our co-workers got divorced. But then we just knew that the husband did something bad. Those girls who were with you and kissed other guys at after-work events must have caught them. Well, I was the oldest. I think I was 38 at the time. And a guy transferred to our office from Chicago, and I thought he was just cute. He was 33 and unmarried, or so he said. Turns out he was my age and married, but his wife had to stay in Chicago until the house was sold and the school year was over, both for the kids and for her job as a teacher. Well, once I started, and even after I found out what a liar Russ was, I continued. Peter found out, confronted me, and gave me an ultimatum, never again. I agreed and then went to look for another Russ. My drinking got worse, and girls' nights out after work became an almost daily occurrence. Peter got angry one night, hired a babysitter for the kids, and came to a bar he thought I had been to. He got it right at the wrong time. I found my new stallion, just he was supposed to be a one-night stand, and I had my legs spread in the back seat of his car when Peter found me. All he did was take a couple of photos of me at the crime scene and headed home. Two weeks later, I was served with a petition for divorce, and after about four months, I went to court. I was a cheater, and he became deceived. The court system was typical of Cincinnati. As the pilots would say when you landed there, Ladies and gentlemen, you just landed at Greater Cincinnati Airport. Please set your watches back 20 years. I was happy. I got the kids, the house, and most of Peter's checks, $2,500 a month for child support and maintenance. Lots of parting gifts for my acts of infidelity. These checks, coming like clockwork, in addition to my salary, made me so happy that I started drinking even more. Almost two years after that, Peter's parents filed a complaint with the Child Welfare Agency, and they began to investigate me. They told me to improve, or they would have to take action. I'm very embarrassed about what I have to say next, but I have to be honest. There was the next time, four months later, I went out after work, got very drunk, and went with the guy to his house. After we had sex, I passed out and woke up at 9 a.m. the next day. It took me until the afternoon before my head cleared before I remembered my children. When I got home, Peter's parents had already taken them in and a restraining order was issued against me from coming within 500 feet of their house. Peter requested an emergency hearing in family court and my custody was revoked. Alimony and maintenance were stopped and the house was returned to my husband the only thing worse that could happen to me, and it did. After four months, I was fired from my job due to excessive absenteeism. It was written on the dismissal paper. In fact, I was caught drunk at work. Strange, no one told me that my family had moved to Dallas. My husband's company moved from the Cincinnati area because they acquired a distribution network that was very strong in the southeast and southwest United States, and the airport service was much better than in Cincinnati after Delta gave up its hub status. So I found another job for about half the salary of my previous job and continued drinking. Only instead of drinking in bars, I drank at home. Instead of Bombay Sapphire, I drank Gilbay's and bought it in 1.75 liter bottles. My binges usually lasted about 10 days. I thought I had hit rock bottom when I started meeting guys for good food and sex. The love component didn't bother me. I was completely humiliated by the time a year had passed and decided to stop trading sex for dinner at Applebee's. But the drinking always continued until I had my first episode of acute alcoholism, 
Memory loss. Quite severe, no short-term memory. Classic symptoms of a blackout. And I began to give up alcohol. I've been sober for almost two years. Yes, I still had a drink or two from time to time, but rarely and always in moderation. At least that's what I thought, until that man I was telling you about found me wandering down the street, muttering to myself and trying to figure out who I was. I would probably still be in a mental hospital in Cincinnati if it weren't for him. He assumed I was having a strokey, and being also a recovering addict, knew it was likely a result of my days of excessive drinking. I had no insurance, no hospital would take me, but the ambulance took me to Good Samaritan, and this man stayed with me. When the hospital said they were going to transfer me because I was an insolvent patient, he took out his checkbook and wrote the hospital a check for $50,000. He gave them a heads up to wait until they confirmed he could cover it when the neurosurgeon came over and asked the nurses to take me back to the medical ward in the emergency room. Two hours later, they discovered a leak in my brain, possibly due to excessive drinking, but if it wasn't treated quickly, I could become another vegetable in Ohio State's hopeless ward. I didn't recover quickly, but my special friend was with me every step of the way. He even welcomed me into his home, a beautiful condo overlooking the Ohio River. It was the most beautiful place I've ever seen. I cooked and cleaned with him. He retired after selling his business and then liquidating his shares when the stock price soared. He did charity work in gratitude for AA's help in regaining his sobriety and several charities in downtown Cincinnati that cared for the homeless and those who could not get enough food each month. We did it together when I was able, and after a few weeks some of my memories returned. At this stage I asked him if I could sleep with him for comfort and warmth. It was a bitter winter in Cincinnati, and one evening we returned from the soup kitchen, frozen to the bone. We both agreed that we were broken and a sexual relationship would be wrong, maybe later, but not now. I was able to learn his full story, including his alcoholism, his abandonment of his family, and the shame he felt for his actions. A few weeks after New Year's, a television station asked if I would be willing to do an interview. They said that someone might recognize me and this would help me regain my memory. My friend didn't want to do this. I realized that he did not want to appear in public doing a good deed. But he agreed because he knew it could be good if someone saw my face as part of the story. Nothing came of it in Cincinnati, but it appears that some ABC affiliates, including the one in Dallas, aired the story on their morning newscast. You know, now I remember that he once asked me if I knew what the phone number was. When he said it, I had no idea. Then he said I was saying it in my sleep and repeating it as if I was on the phone with someone and repeating it so I could call them back. Looks like I did this three nights in a row. I didn't think about it anymore. And he didn't ask either. He remembered it again when our ABC station gave him a number to call. Since I wasn't working, my friend said he had enough money for both of us to live on. I repaid him by running errands. One day I went shopping and returned almost two hours later. My friend met me at the door and said, Rita, we need to talk. I was scared to death. What have I done? Please don't kick me out. I'm still so vulnerable. We went to sit down, but I started shaking, almost convulsing, and crying sobs. He reached out to comfort me and assured me that nothing bad had happened, but that he had something important to tell. That number, Rita, the one you kept repeating in your sleep, was the number of a detective agency in Dallas. They are working for a client from there who is looking for Rita Collins. Your maiden name was Scott. Is that you? They said they once called your answering machine and left a message. In the dream, you remembered this number because they asked you to call them back. My memory returned, but it was unstable. I suspected Collins was my married name, but Scott. Something from my past flashed into my mind. I saw a man. Yes, it was. My father and my mother was calling him, Scotty, go get Rita and come to dinner. Yes, I was Scott. Mom called my dad, Scotty. My friend said he was pretty sure it was true and had already told the agency that he thought he knew where she was and who she was. He told me, your husband and children are looking for you. They hoped you're still alive and assumed you were still in Cincinnati, so that was a good guess. Rita, they want to come see you. They want you back. Home with them. It turned out that Peter had hired a private detective agency to find me, 
and one of their agents saw the story on the news. They called our station in Cincinnati, then called my friend, and he set up my first conversation with Peter in almost 10 years. Now I'm back in my family's life, but I think about my friend every day. He's so lonely. I wish him a happy life, just like mine now. I cried all night. Oh, my God. What can I say to them to make them love me again? But even worse at that moment, how can I leave my good friend, this person whom I love? I love him very much and cannot leave him. He is still looking for solace in his life. That night we talked until the early morning hours of the next day. He asked me about the happiest days of my life. Remember, my memory was still weak, but I gave the birth dates of my two children. And then June 17, 1993, 28 years ago. It was the day I married Peter, and I remembered how happy I was that day, especially now that he wanted to start our lives over again. I noticed that Jones suddenly became very quiet and sad, but she continued, You know what's most amazing about that date? It was also my friend Robert's wedding date. The day, month, and year exactly. Can you imagine? Joan, 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 talk to me, Joan. She fell to the floor and lost consciousness. I called an ambulance. By the time they arrived, Joan had regained consciousness. The team checked her vital signs and said there was no need for transport. Perhaps she was dehydrated. I gave her water to drink and hugged her tenderly as the tears were still flowing. She began to speak, but I could not understand her words. It must be him. It must be him. Oh, please, God, let it be him. Your friend Robert has the same wedding date as you and I. It must be my Robert. You call his friend. His name is Robert. Yes, yes. It's impossible for all three of us to have the same wedding date. Well, it probably could be, but it's borderline impossible. Rita, can I talk to him? I need to talk to him. We are still married. I was so ashamed of my behavior that I could not do this with a good man. He was almost perfect until he found out about my two scams and started drinking heavily when I began to humiliate him with my behavior. Oh, God, what have I done? What have I done? I'm so ashamed. Joan, one evening when Robert and I were talking, I told him how much I wanted to apologize to my husband, even though I couldn't remember his name at the time. He told me about his experience at AA and how he needed to talk to you and your children to apologize for my behavior. This is what I want more than anything in life, he said. I can die in peace if I finish this, the last stage of my 12-step program. Then I asked him if he was also ready to forgive you. His answer was, I have already forgiven her completely. There is no more room in my heart and soul for hatred or mistrust. Joan called each of her children that night, just as I called Peter. Peter couldn't believe he lived two blocks away from a woman married to the man who saved his wife. After Joan explained Robert's schedule for each day, we scheduled a call from Joan's house for the following night. Robert typically watched the news at 11 to p.m. before bed, and the time difference in Dallas was an hour earlier. So we planned to call around 10 to p.m. Dallas time when he was rested and ready for bed. Robert. I was left alone again for the five months that followed. This time my loneliness was different. I was optimistic that my life was getting better. I remembered what Ralph had promised me in my dreams, so I laughed. He never broke a promise in his life after he regained his sobriety. I couldn't believe I was talking to myself again and again wondering what changes I could make in my life. In the grand scheme of time, I didn't have much time to think. Friday was a very busy day at the soup kitchen, so I got home later than usual. I couldn't wait to put my phone on the nightstand, change into my pajamas, and make a cup of hot chocolate, one of my few remaining vices after I got sober. I walked out of the kitchen, and my phone started ringing. Most nights I'd just leave it on voicemail, but damn, today I answered, Hello? It was quiet from the other end. I was ready to press the red button when I heard a voice. Dad, is that you? I can't believe we found you. Greg, oh my God. Greg, how are you? It's so nice to hear your voice. Where are you? I miss you and your brother and sister. Are you married? Do you have children? Can you come see me? Oh God, I missed my family, even Joan. I'm so sorry I was such a terrible person. I cried hysterically. I didn't think I could continue. Dad, Mom is here with me. She needs to talk to you. 
Don't hang up on us. Please don't hang up on us again. Robert, are you still here? I would tie Joan's voice through, even if it sounded quiet in the noisy subway car. Yes, I'm here, Joan. I'm so sorry for the person I was, and I'm so sorry for destroying our family. That's what I was trying to tell you when I called. That was 10, 11 years ago. That means that I have truly completed the 12 steps of atonement. Robert, no need to apologize. I destroyed our family with my scams. Yes, there were more than one. I feel terrible for what I put you through. It was my actions that made you resort to the bottle, but I never stopped loving you. Robert, you should know, I never divorced you. We're still married, and, and, and I still love you very much. It hurts. I didn't know what to think. This miserable image of a man being forgiven by the family he abandoned for a few liters of scotch and bourbon. Robert, I have to tell you a surprising but true story that happened last week. We have lived in this area of Dallas for almost six years, and one of our neighbors is divorced and has two children, and his situation was similar to ours. He was trying to find his ex-wife so she could return to her family. Apparently, there was an online story in Cincinnati about a woman who couldn't remember her identity. The story was about her and her struggle, and the kindness of the man who helped her restore his memory and ultimately provided him with the information to reunite with his wife. You know Rita. She's here with her husband Peter and their children. I became friends with her. She kept telling me about her special, wonderful man, how she loved him as much as she loved her ex-husband and knew he was so depressed when she left. Then she told me the most amazing thing. You know, she said, my wedding and his wedding were on the exact same day, June 17th, 1993, our anniversary. Robert, it was your Rita. She lives two blocks from us. When I screamed that you were my husband, she gave me your phone number. I couldn't catch my breath. How could this happen? It was like a 330 million shot. I didn't deserve this. I have sinned so many times. I am still afraid to enter church even though I have restored the faith of my childhood. I still have the piece of paper she left me. I just took it out of my wallet two days ago. I can't understand why she wrote. Ralph called and said all is forgiven in heaven and on earth. My thoughts were a mess. I didn't know what to say next. Tears flowed from my eyes so quickly that I formed a puddle on the chair I was sitting on. I think all I said was, Joan, can I please come home? I need you and the kids, please. Two days later, I was on an American Airlines flight to Dallas. My thoughts were still confused. I couldn't concentrate. I couldn't even remember how old my children were. I know they're probably done with school by now. Well, maybe not. I took out my diary, which I put in the front seat pocket. Let's see. It's 2021, and my oldest daughter was born in 1993, so she's 28. My oldest son was born in 1996, so he's 25, and my youngest was born in 2000. Yes, I remember the day he was born, the day he was borners, and I thought the election would be discussed until he went to kindergarten. I might be able to see him graduate from college. I thought the flight took forever, maybe 20 hours to get there. Time passed too slowly. Then, as the plane approached Dallas, time began to speed up. I wasn't ready for this. This is just a ploy to embarrass me. What will I do? How can I show my face? Will they be disappointed with me? Will they ultimately decide it was a bad idea? I started having a panic attack. Then I heard a quiet voice. It was Ralph. Robert, I told you that all is forgiven in heaven and on earth. Live the life you deserve. You are a good man, Robert, and I will be glad to meet you here when your day comes. But that is not now. Live yours. Life to the fullest. Accept your well-deserved reward on earth. All I know is that I am now with my wife and three children, two of whom are married, and my granddaughter and will be attending my youngest son's graduation from Texas A&M in May, as well as his nomination ceremony. Life really is good. Oh, my little granddaughter is calling. See you later. Because it matters, for your reference, the 12 steps, as described in the original big book and presented by AA, are as follows. 1. Admitting powerlessness over addiction. 2. Believing that a higher power can help. 3. The decision to surrender control to a higher power. 
4. Compilation of personal inventory. 5. Admitting to a higher power, yourself and another person, the mistakes you have made. 6. Willingness to allow a higher power to correct any character flaws. 7. Request to a higher power to remove these shortcomings. 8. Making a list of wrongs done to others and being willing to correct those wrongs. 9. Compensation for damages to those who were wronged, if it does not cause them harm. 10. Continue to maintain personal inventory and admit mistakes when they are made. 11. The desire for enlightenment and connection with a higher power through prayer and meditation. 12. Passing on the message of the 12 steps to others in need. Subscribe to our channel so that your second chaff doesn't cheat on you and go ahead and listen to the next story, because this story is nothing compared to the next one. If you're under 18, don't even think about listening to the next one.